Firstly, I'd like to thank uh, people at Data by the Bay for such a great conference, and you all for staying for one of the last talks in the conference. Um, my talk, so I'm not a pharma or a biomedical person, as you could probably tell from my background. So forgive me if I kind of throw terms all over, uh, because it took me a long time to actually understand concepts, diseases, and symptoms, and how you differentiate them, et cetera. And uh, my talk is going to be on the details of how to use machine learning and natural language processing to extract medical attributes. And also, I'll take a step, step back for a more general solution. So let's see. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, my goal is to extract medical attributes, such as age groups, side effects, ethnicity, the drugs that are being studied, uh, from clinical trials, as well as from FDA drug labels. And then also figure out how they are related. For instance, a drug and a disease can be related because that drug actually treats that disease. It can also be related because that disease is a side effect of taking the drugs. So also to dig through and find out the relations between these entities. And not all of them will be connected, but uh, some of the, them will be. And the main motivation for this is we have heard quite a bit about personalized medicine today. And uh, there the idea being that a 200 pound man with fever should not get the same dose of Tylenol as me uh, with a similar kind of uh, symptoms. So something like studying clinical trials and try getting all these um, entities out and figuring out the relationships between them actually gives you access or gives you uh, an idea about personalized medicine without having to do more trials. Uh, and that's like one of the goals for doing such an extraction. So first thing, uh, that I look at is FDA drug labels. And these drug labels are the drug labels that comes behind your Tylenol box. Uh, except that they get updated very frequently and new drugs come in. And typically the one you'll find behind your uh, medicine uh, pill box may not be the latest one for that product. So it's, it's, a, it's a very um, dynamic kind of data. And uh, the first thing that I look at is the relationship between drugs and diseases, and the relationship is that they, whether it treats it. And a, a very similar can be done, a similar thing can be done for side effects and some of the other uh, attributes. And these are some of the examples of the data. So um, if you look at, it is indicated for treating respiratory disorder caused due to allergy. Now, what I'm going for is I shouldn't just uh, extract respiratory disorder and allergy because this drug treats respiratory disorder and not allergy. So I'm going for the exact symptom that the drug is treating. And then there are like more uh, simple sentences and uh, more complex sentences uh, here. And a lot of the time the sentences are not even very understandable in English terms. And I kind of did not put them up so that you get a feel for uh, what to extract. The other thing that I'm looking at is clinical trials. And clinical trials are a little harder than FDA drug labels because um, typically FDA drug labels have somewhat a structure that is uh, you can identify that your, uh, the content you're looking for is within these three sentences. For FDA drug labels, I had to do more uh, topic modeling and other kinds of NLP to just extract the sentences that contain the information. Uh, also, my goal in the FDA drug label, uh, sorry, in the clinical trial data was much wider. I kind of want to extract all of these uh, metadata. I want to uh, extract the age of the subject being studied, the gender, uh, the side effects, the duration of the study, uh, et cetera. And um, the hardest part here, of course, is that uh, it's very hard to find training data once you move out of the simple drug disease regime. And uh, this is another one with just side effects. Uh, and the uh, questions I'm trying to answer, uh, one of the things uh, I'm hoping to find, especially out of clinical trials, is off-label drug uses. And we heard a little bit about this today as well. And um, it would be quite interesting to see uh, new, um, new treatments of the same drugs that existed. So maybe like some uh, drug for depression actually cures hair loss. Uh, that would be pretty great. Uh, the other is database completion. So there are a lot of databases, like UMMLS, for instance, a talk that happened uh, about an hour or two hours ago, um, that contain data, which kind of get updated. There are also multiple databases. There's UMMLS, there's SNOMED, there's BioPortal, and all of these get updated at different times. So 
the idea of doing like a drug disease extraction is also that if you can gather all of the text data, and if you run an extraction every night, you actually have the most recent uh, complete database, and you don't have to worry about how do I, like how do I get my head around all these five databases that exist around the world. Uh, the caveat here also is that you have to get around how do you get all of your text data in one place, which is, again, non-trivial. And the other place where this can be useful is when people start clinical trials, a very common question is, what have, has been studied before? Or uh, are these drugs, like, on, on what conditions are these drugs studied? Or are these compounds in the drug studied in some way? And most of the time, people don't know how to uh, query those results. So converting like all of this text data into structured format would help in, to generate queries like this. So, and uh, in order to get the training data, I actually took it from UMLS. And the first time I looked into UMLS, it's, um, it's actually very daunting, especially if you're not from the pharma community. There are concepts, there are uh, disease names, then there are viruses, and you don't know what and how to get it. So actually, at the end of the day, I had someone who worked in pharma pull out 8,000 um, 8, disease and drug names for me uh, for this particular uh, problem. And uh, the course of action was the first extract the sentences that contained the data. Uh, in the next phase, uh, use POS tags to actually get the candidates that might be diseases. And for POS tags, Specifically, I had used nouns and phrases or bigrams or trigrams around nouns. And then extract features. So if you read the sentences, if you read like sufficient amount of the sentences, what you realize is that uh, the, uh, the disease that is treated by a drug is typically in kind of a, some kind of a syntactic or s syntactic format in that sentence. So what it it told me was that the context of the word was very important in figuring out uh, whether it was a, a disease that the drug was treating, and also like the position seemed like it would be important. So these are the two things I picked out. Uh, I used both like a window that I created myself, but I also used uh, word-to-vec ve um, vectors for these disease uh, phrases. And then the next part that I did was, so I have these candidates uh, that I generated, and then here is like my data for my training data. So I kind of created a mapping between the two. And so this was a process of automatic, automatically generating the training data, and this also had some error. And I'll speak a little bit more about it once I show the results. And once this process has been done, uh, I, ta I typically feed it to a machine learning uh, mo model, and uh, the model predicts whether this is a disease that a drug treats or not to go about doing it. So this is like a typically uh, lemmatized sentence. And these are the nouns and the noun phrases that came out of it. And you see there are lots of uh, nouns apart from diseases. There's maintenance, therapy, intensity, episode. And uh, when you create a training set, what you have is, like I call this rule-based prediction, but basically th these are the candidates. So you say, all of these are my candidates. And then you use the training data to generate which one is actually a disease. Uh, now, a typical thing that happens is for every sentence, you'll find typically one disease that the drug treats and a lot of nouns that are just there. So they're just zero. So if you take the model just by itself, it'll be a very disbalanced model. You'll have very few positives and mostly negatives. So it's important to go in and kind of balance your training data so you have equal numbers of positives and negatives to build a good model. Uh, so another thing that I, ha I had done is to build the word vectors, and I used GenSub for that purpose. Uh, and I also initialized the vocabulary with pre-trained vectors, which uh, gave slightly better results. And since I um, was working with word vectors, I decided we needed to have some um, man plus woman kind of thing. So I, I added some uh, depression-related diseases. It's not as much fun when you have depression here, but ADHD plus manic episode can be bipolar disorder, then respiratory disorder per al plus allergy could be common cold, and they don't make any sense in this context, but it's just for fun. Um, and uh, this is pretty much like after all the feature, uh, feature engineering, 
and all, all like the data cleaning, and most of the work goes in that, like the data cleaning, the feature engineering, the tokenizations. Uh, this is the code that actually does the machine learning modeling. And I have a completely Python stack, uh, with the exception of the Stanford NLP parser, uh, which kind of gives really nice lemmatized uh, outputs, pause tags, then dependency parsing of the data. Um, and so I feed the data to a pipeline like this, and um, typically I do something like a grid search or a hyperparameter tuning to get the best possible answers and the best possible um, machine learning module. Um, and I, I get the answers. So this is like the, to the previous slide was just uh, this box. And this is like the typical machine learning NLP uh, pipeline. Uh, you do feature extraction. Um, you do uh, create label data. Uh, you have tokenization initially. You feed it to your machine learning pipeline, do hyperparameter tuning, and then um, base your answer on the metrics. Any questions so far? So here is one of the results, a uh, nice one. And the drug name was lithium carbonate. Uh, and it cures bipolar disorder and manic episode. And these are the words that were like not related to disease at all. And so it predicted uh, to be zero. So one is the ones it treats. I also want to show some examples where it goes wrong. Uh, so it goes wrong for two reasons. One reason is here where uh, the prediction itself is not good. The other reason is sometimes the labeling of the data is not very good in the training set. Uh, so for instance, in here, in the training set, basically it was labeled as uh, not a disease, whereas this is like a cream that is used in third degree um, burns. And the um, model predicted some of these as, um, uh, as correct, but this was still went into, it still contributed to the score going lower. And this, this can be improved more uh, the automatic uh, creation of uh, training data. Uh, so the next thing I'm looking at is uh, the exploration of different uh, machine learning models. And one thing you notice is that most of the machine learning models give pretty high uh, precision recall uh, and F1 scores. And one of the reasons for that is for this specific data, I had very good um, a training set. And for the other uh, metadata that I'm trying to extract, the main hindrance is the training set. And that's what I'll talk about for the rest of the time. Uh, the other thing that we see is that pretty much all of the techniques do similar and pretty well. So I am sticking with logistic regression because in future I kind of need to deploy something like this on larger amounts of data or on data with big pharma companies. So doing this at Accenture, one of the goals is also to create like a proof of concept uh, that can be reapplied to different kinds of data. So one version of the code will be like having a Spark version, which does like tokenization, logistic regression produces an answer. And for that purpose, I typically try to go with the simplest model that works. Uh, so now the clinical trials data. And you could approach the clinical trials data exactly similarly. You could have uh, nouns, uh, noun phrases are used different kinds of pause tagging uh, to extract words. And then you could just say that, you know, is this word uh, referring to the age? Is this word referring to duration of the, uh, of the drug being um, administered? Is it referring to the disease itself? The problem with something like age or dosage is that I start with no training data. And so that's the problem that I'm working on right now. And um, what I'm trying, what I want to do is I want to have a training data uh, that's like this for every sentence where whatever I extract uh, will have like uh, a one in one of these verticals and I can use it to extract um, the attributes. And I only have tra training data for, um, for this kind of data, like the, um, the relationship between drug and side effects, drug and disease, and also drugs itself. And for the other ones, I have to figure out either manually or semi-supervised way of generating the training data. And this has been basically the hardest part of the project. Once you figure out how to, once you break down your problem in such a way that you can uh, put it in a machine learning algorithm, it's fairly easy to find a model that will give you a relatively good answer. 
So one of the things that I am trying right now uh, is um, I am cr uh, just like uh, the previous part. I'm creating candidate set uh, of uh, nouns or even other pause tags. Uh, I'm sticking to nouns right now, uh, and then I'm taking something like hand labeling a hundred of them. After hand labeling a hundred of them, I'm generating a set of rules, and the rules could be like, for instance, OX say occurs in drugs quite frequently. Um, or, and I have some more rules, uh, which I'll go into later. And so I generate a set of rules, and I use those rules to get a data set uh, that has 95% accuracy. And once I have that, I kind of um, look at this data set, and I, I change the rules so that the accuracy keeps increasing. The other thing to kind of keep in mind is this is an iterative process, but you should not iterate more than two to three times because then your training set might become very close to the rules and you might just be keeping, you might just keep fitting to the rules once you go to the machine learning part. So iterate a few times, not more than three. And the best way is finally when you have a sample, if it's, if you have enough resources, which I don't currently, but if you're working in pharma, you might, um, is to go through like, reduce your data down to maybe 5% of your total data and then find human resources to actually um, guarantee 100% accuracy in the 5% of your data. And because if you've, you've reduced it so much, you have a very small data set, which you might have human time for, uh, but you have 100% gold standard data for whatever you're trying to find out. Uh, so some examples of rules are, for instance, if you're going for age, the sentence should contain numbers. Uh, or the first one is dosage, so it should contain numbers, it should contain terms like milligrams, mg, and other forms of uh, dosages. And these are things you can find out by exploring your data. Uh, contains the word dose, but also look at other synonyms of dose. Uh, as a matter of fact, you could do word to vec on top of your medical journal, put dose in and see all, what the other words are, and uh, have a rule that contains those words. Similar things for age. Uh, contains numbers, contains year old, um, and um, and to start the process, you don't even have to know all the rules. You could start with like three rules, and you could reduce your data down. Once you reduce your data down, you could go and explore the data, data look at the data, do n-grams on the data, and figure out uh, another set of rules that makes your um, that makes your makes the error go down further. So to begin with, you could have just 70% accuracy your rules could give you, and then you could keep improving from there. And a typical set of codes um, that are there for uh, generating rules. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about, and uh, this is a program from, um, or a software from Stanford that I have been working with a little bit. It's called Deep Dive, and what it promises to do is you throw all your data in. It could be JSON, it could be PDFs, it could be um, text files, and it will and you also need to know your candidates, and you basically need to do all the work till before the machine learning part. And you feed, feed that data into Deep Dive, and it'll create a structured database for you. Now, I started this project actually six months ago, and I thought, okay, this is magic, and I can throw in all the clinical trials data out, and out will come the age, uh, dosage, et cetera. So it's not that simple. It's actually, you have to put in quite a bit of work uh, but the part that it makes easy is, uh, if you're not a machine learning engineer, you don't have to worry about, should I use logistic regression? Should I use random forest? What do I do with hyperparameter tuning? Uh, it gives you an answer, and it gives you the uh, probability of getting that answer. Uh, so that's the re really neat part, is you don't have to worry much. And initially, when I started working with this, uh, it had a lot of overhead in the sense that you had to uh, know your data structure ahead of time and create the entire architecture and then start the problem. Uh, luckily, these days they've made it uh, easier for prototyping and they've put everything, like you can do it on an IPython notebook. Uh, so again, the typical way of using the uh, lighter version, which I have been uh, using a little bit lately, is you create the candidates either through nouns or maybe you have a set of candidates uh, stored somewhere. Uh, you have some labeling functions. You feed them in, and uh, the model works on it, gives you an output. Most likely, you won't be happy with the output. Uh, then you go back and look at the output. And uh, they also have a really neat um, UI to look at the output. Uh, so the UI, actually, I'll um, just go directly to the UI. 
So the UI actually um, marks the ones that have been um, tagged by the code as your, um, as your attribute. And you could go in and kind of do, this is wrong, this is right, like for some of them. And that data gets, that feedback gets stored into it. And you could use that feedback to retrain the model. So I have found one thing to be really cool here is even, even though, even if I don't use deep dive, just for looking at this data, this UI is really great. And the other thing that I wanted to show was uh, the IPython notebook is also very convenient. So basically you can load the code up and all of this is kind of available open source and these IPython notebooks are also available. So you can uh, load the code up and uh, load your data into it and there is some formatting but not, not a lot. And once you load the candidates, you can actually look at the candidates in the IPython notebook itself. And then you can use the code to write your labeling functions and use the code to get your answers. So um, this is pretty neat. They've only done this IPython notebook thing for the past, I, I don't think it's even a month old. So it's very much on the, uh, it's very much being developed. And if you look at it like, I feel like a few months from now, it might be much easier to use than it is right now. Um, and uh, so this is like the workflow for deep dive. And this is a typical workflow that I have also used uh, in my machine learning modules, except in the models and features there, I have done the uh, machine learning and the hyperparameter uh, tuning. And there are two things, when you come back and change the rules, there are two things you do. One thing you, sometimes you realize is that you're missing out when you look at the data, you're missing out most of the can candidates. In that case, you need a rule set and compass everything. And then the other part is where you realize um, that the accuracy is not good enough, which means the rules need to be more complex or maybe you need to add three more rules. And uh, this is like one of the neat um, renderings from uh, the deep dive light as well. And it's just a D3 on their back end, but it basically talks about a gene that causes sex reversal. And yeah, that's it. And so in conclusion, um, NLP relationship extraction and machine learning is not very difficult if you have very good training data. And the, for most projects, I concentrate most of my time in gathering training data and finding gold labels. Uh, another thing in pharma that has, uh, I've only worked in pharma for like four to six months, and what has struck out to me is that there is a lot of data, but it's very, very spread out. So what would be really beneficial is if someone like me who doesn't work in the field could go to one place and find all the data or there would be like easier APIs for getting the data. Uh, and most of the conclusions that we make should be made from the entire volume of data and not from data silos because we're kind of missing out when we don't include all of the papers. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I've got. Uh, at Accenture, we are hiring all kinds of people, data scientists, engineers, so uh, if you're looking for a job, um, email me. And uh, I'm also writing blogs about this pharma stuff. So, yeah. Questions? So, uh, may I ask, um, where do you see the sort of lowest hanging fruit in terms of the the first things that these bringing these methods will 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 allow? So, the lowest hanging some of the lowest hanging fruits are data that has not been tapped in the sense of uh, doctor's notes or laboratory notes or even uh, published clinical trials. So, FDA drug labels are actually not the lowest hanging fruits. It was a good kind of proof of, proof of concept to start with. Uh, but these are the places where the, there's data, and it's not a lot of work to actually extract that data out. And because there's like a community out there, I feel like if we share the training sets, if we share more of the information, it's, it's, it won't be very hard to get things like, um, the, like dosages or uh, age groups, and these things don't exist. So when I spoke to the healthcare care people, uh, at Accenture, uh, they were like, yeah, these are information we need, and they, they're not in a database. Thanks. 
Well, thanks for a, a really fascinating talk and sharing your research. Um, hopefully you'll be around uh, if people have more questions later. Yeah, sure. Great, thank you very much.